What's up, man? How are you? I'm very good. How are you? Good, good, good. Uh, so you're in LA? Yep. Been here the whole of the COVID. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm here in New York at uh, Phillips Space. Nice. And uh, wanted to say thanks for you know spending time to chat. Uh, we got the 20th Century Contemporary Art um, sale that's going to happen on July 2nd. And uh, you know they invited us to just kind of talk a little bit about the works, but I think also thinking about these works in the context of what's happening now. Yeah. Um, the most important. Yeah. So I'm, I'm excited to you know just have a conversation. I mean, we we had a previous chat, and uh, it was just kind of great to just kind of hear how you were thinking about things, and uh, so we'll go through a couple of works. Um, I think highlights at least from my perspective of artists from various generations who are dealing with a lot of issues that are really resonant right now. Um, and so I think, you know, we'll jump into it and then keep it flowing. Sounds good. Does that work? Yes. So the first artist is um, Nina Chanel Abney, and the piece is called Mr. Baker, which was created in 2017. So Nina is from Chicago. Now I think she's based in Jersey. One thing that I really love about her work is that She's, she's able to use kind of the, the taffy that comes with, black, with, with bright colors to kind of pull you in and really dig into some very heavy subject matter. So whether that's, you know, police brutality, whether that's, you know, issues around identity, issues around creating space, um, she's able to, you know, really hone in on a lot of things. Um, and I was kind of curious, you know, when you saw this you know, painting, what did you think? What, what resonated with you? You're right, she uses the colors and the whole um, pop art thing to draw you in to something that isn't, you know, isn't talked about in popular culture. And you know, that's, a, that's a technique that um, most or every black artist is um, relegated to, to get, to get this message across through the Trojan Horse technique to um, something that is appeasing to maybe the white gaze and then uh -huh. bring bring people into the black gaze right but far as this particular painting what jumps out first thing is those the black birds i interpret them as like crows you know jim crow jim crow yep you know the the whiteness of the the figure of the person mr baker and then the blackness the black box the no you know yeah. the body of the the black person, like, no, and that's pretty much um, the existence of uh, people of color, black people in America is no, you know? Yeah. Um, also, another interesting thing just, and that's what's great about talking with you is not just talking about the particular piece, but then like how the artist connects to what's going on. Because with Nina, you know, if people do a little research on her and you know her, uh, yeah. According to what I read about her, her childhood, she was, um, she was called, she was made fun of, you know, saying she yeah. talked, talked white in school yeah, yeah. and how she um, inundated herself with the black kids in school was through drawings of black figures. And then that's how she got in, you know, and I feel like that's exactly that's interesting to talk about what's going on now, because there's this war, so like there's the war going on between, you know, people of color, black people and system, systematic racism, but also there's a war going on, layered divisions if, inside the black community. And it's like, I see a lot of blacks calling out other blacks, like, you don't yeah. represent enough. You, you hang around white people too much, or you talk too white, yeah. or you don't, you know, so it's, you know, when I, when I learned that about her, it was very interesting that she had to, through her art, she had to use that to, to convince her own community that she was down for the cause, you know? And um, I think that's an interesting thing that a lot of, I mean, all blacks are educated. You know, first thing you're educated yeah. is in pain. But yeah. blacks are educated more in Western culture more so than some of our um, others in our culture. 
and it's neither one's worse or better, but then that creates a division. And that's just another part yeah. of white supremacy, racism that, you know, I think, you know, she's dealing with. She had to deal with even before she went to art school, you know, and it's still, you know, so it's, it's really, it's really interesting. And that's the thing, you know, you know, preaching to the choir, like, it's not even just a particular piece. It's the, the artist, because, you it's know. Whole, yeah, it's her whole practice. And I think a lot of that, you know, you also have to think about, at least for me, I consider Chicago and, 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 and growing up in Chicago and what that means, uh, because that's a very kind of unique space, um, similar to New York and L.A. Um, but I think, you know, she really kind of gets to the nuance of, of how dynamic, you know, the black experience is, um, how layered that is, um, and you can't really wrap your arms around this fully. Um, and so how do you create space to kind of engage the multiplicity of perspectives, ways of living, ways of communicating, ways of expressing um, in, the, in, 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 a, in a fashion that feels you know, authentic, really? Yeah, 100%. And then also, you know, we can't leave out just not just being a black artist, but a black woman artist and even more space she has to fight for to exactly. to get her um her her ideas out you know yeah. just being so dealing you're dealing with a um not a negative in the i say the actual world but in the world of um systematic racism you know she's dealing with the negative of being a woman that all women all women suffer from and then yeah. a black woman you know yeah which is probably one of the toughest things to the maybe the toughest thing you know black woman indigenous woman uh woman of color to be in the world and then being a black woman that extends in the art world yeah. that's a whole nother yeah. you know so it's just yeah. like but I, th I think that's what attracts me to the work because she's able to express her point of view with such um confidence and defiance yeah um, and it's, it's almost like the, um, it's the, uh, the phrase, be so good, they can't ignore you. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think you could say the same for like a Carrie James Marshall, where like, regardless of subject matter, the way he throw paint down, you can't deny his mastery. Um, and I think she's, she's one of the artists of her generation who's kind of working towards that point. No. Yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying is like. Yeah, she's talking about the plight of black people, but any subject matter she, she like you said, she throws down on a canvas, it's gonna grab yeah. you just off, just skill alone. You know, her, yeah. her um, yeah. it's not just built off the story she's telling, just her raw talent and skill, you know? Cause even if, you know, you yeah. showed, you could show this to someone, who, I mean, I don't know who you'd find that doesn't know anything about what's going on in the world, but if you found someone who was totally oblivious, you know, that still would grab them, you know? Just the, color, the usage of exactly. color, the usage of space, you know? It's amazing. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. So maybe we should jump to the next one. Noah Davis, who passed a couple years ago. Incredible painter. Um, this piece is 100 years of entertainment. So it's actually five panels. Um, Noah is also uh, the co-founder of the Underground Museum, which is in Los Angeles. Um, and this piece for me is cool because I've never seen it before and I've never seen him work in this way. Yeah, nor have I. Where you, know, you, where, you know, you have basically five panels that exist as one group, but then if you look at each painting individually, it also tells a story within the story. And just thinking about like um, the entertainment industry and you know, particularly the prevalence of folks of color within that space, and that's kind of been a space where they've been able to thrive to a degree. It's kind of interesting, because like if you look at it, um, one of the pieces, it looks like some type of jewelry box and people like dancing around it. Yeah. Um, but what I loved about Noah was that um, he was just defiant as an artist, he was defiant as a person against the status quo. Um, and he was another example of this artist who was working towards mastery and just the way he's painted, like I haven't really seen anybody, you know, of his generation since. Like when he had to show as Werner, 
um, a couple months ago. That's the most people I've seen that at opening um, in a long time. And what was dope is that it wasn't just art people. That just, opening looked crazy. I was, I never, know, was, I never get FOMO. I had FOMO when I was, I saw that popping up on the gram and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And so I think it's just, it's, it's, he's a great example of like really capturing the temperature, but then, you know, expressing it in a way that's just truly unique. Um, he developed a very specific vocabulary and language and aesthetic that has been really interesting to see young painters who like are looking towards his work. And it's just like, oh, wow, you're painting like Noah. Um, and for me, that says a lot for any creative when you can, you know, begin to, you know, almost father a style, for lack of a better phrase, and have other artists who are inspired by you and responding to what you're doing as an artist. Yeah, man, I mean, you know, the dyad of him and his wife. Uh, yeah. You know, on. this dude's life was art. You know, even yes. creating Underground Museum, maybe a living living art. He created a living art piece. Just the yeah. idea of the Underground Museum, you know, that was, as you know, that was his studio and where him and his family lived. And then for it to become what it was then and what it's become now, you know, I think he's done the thing regardless of race, what all artists are trying to achieve is immortal immortality, you know? Exactly. And he's- Exactly, because um, I, remem I remember his last show at um, Roberts, and no, yeah, at, at Roberts now, but Roberts and Tilton at the time, they did the after set at that space. Yeah. And he was explaining to us the vision and I'm just like looking at him like, what are you talking about, you know? Um, but I think that's also just kind of emblematic of like, you know, iconic creatives where they have a vision that's just kind of beyond, you know, comprehension within that moment. But as you said, you know, they've worked towards imm immortality and, you know, I, we would define the uh, Underground Museum as a social sculpture because it's something that's continuing to evolve, change. It's actually what's been dope is to see that it's become like a blueprint for other museums where you have like, you know, tried and true museums that go to the Underground Museum and they're studying, you know, how they're putting together the shows, how they're engaging the community. Um, they have the Purple Garden series on Friday. Um, and this kind of just holistic approach um, to art, but doing it at a world-class level because I know that was something that was super important to him that like, you know, you could do a De Carava show or a Dina Lawson show, um, but it's gonna be like the best of the best. It's not gonna shortchange the community. And I think that's just how he approached not only his life, but his practice. And I think that's one thing that always gets me excited when I just see his work or go to the space. Yeah, I mean, um, I believe to my knowledge, before, until the Underground Museum, you know, it was always uh, black artists, women artists. If they were in a show that was, they'd be in these shows that are all black artists, all women. And it's almost like the B-League. No exactly. one says it, but that's the undercurrent. And then the A-League is if you are the one black artist or one woman artist that can make it, or the one gay queer artist that can make it into a you know, mostly white male group show. or you know, mostly white male, museum littered with white males, and you get into that to where, um, they, you know, Noah and his wife and um, their friends and his brother, they've created a space where, it, like you said, it is, is, it is the highest level, and the highest level, you know, en encapsulates people of color and women, you know? And that, yeah. you, you know, that's the powerful thing. To this painting, though, some reason it makes me think of that um, Basquiat painting, um, surrounded by snakes. In a way, the title makes okay. me think. You know the one where it's Jim, uh, Joe Lewis surrounded by three white men, and um, in suits. Okay, okay. Yeah, and some reason it makes me think of that more so the title, Hundred Years of Entertainment, because okay. it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's like if you listen to the podcast about music from the 1619 project, that Pulitzer Prize yeah. spinning project that the New York Times did, and there's one podcast uh -huh. that's about music, and uh -huh. just from literally from um, Jim Crow ragtime till now, just we have been entertainment for Western culture. And so I take this title as quite, quite dark, you know? 
but yeah, you know, important to think about. Well, well what's interesting is because I was looking at the painting earlier. It also reminds me of August Wilson's Centennial Cycle where he did the 10 plays that basically each play encapsulates a decade. So like wow. if you think about, you know, Fences, yes. um, Jitney. Um, and so when I think about that, I think about just kind of like, you know, building on what you were talking about, the 16, 19 project, but how August Wilson, you know, thought about this kind of 100 year span of black life, black culture and use the theater um, and it's a canonical series of pieces. You know, it's like in the, I think it's in the Library of Congress, I believe. Wow. Uh, the actual plays. You know, so this man coming from Pittsburgh, um, PA, being able to kind of ascend to the highest heights in, you know, theatrical entertainment. And so when I saw that, I thought about that automatically and just kind of like, just this idea of like 100 years and what can happen within that space of time. Um, and if we think about, you know, the last 50 years, um, 50, 60 years, if you think about, you know, civil rights, you know, and then you think all the things that have come after that, um, it feels like it's generations ago, but it's like still very fresh within the psyche of, of the country. It's just a blink of an eye. Yeah. It's just, it's literally it's, a blink. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's interesting. Um, We'll move on to the next one. Um, one of my favorite people, Carrie Mae Weems. This piece, um, untitled from the series Sea Islands, where you have these three photographs of this architectural structure accompanied by this poem. You know, this made me think a lot about just the idea of just place, um, home. You know, what does home mean? Because it, I think it gives you instructions on what to do when you move in yeah. to a place, move into a space. When I think about it within the context of now, I think there's been this continual struggle journey towards creating space or creating a place. I think we've, you know, particularly folks of color have been able to do that in a ver variety of industries, but it was interesting to just kind of see this piece and how she was able to deconstruct this image and create a portal of sorts. You know, what she's able to do with a very tr traditional way of making art. Photography always astounds me. Either Fiasta or Arthur, AJ said it to me. They were like, you know, a photo, photos painting too, you're painting with light, you know? And then also just how she, she could have put that poem, not even a poem, that those yeah. instructions, you know? Which is the instructions kind of remind me like Yoko Ono, um, Yep. Sunflower book with all the instructions and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But like, let, you know, she could have put it center and it would have been like a cross, but she didn't. Yep. You know? Yeah. So almost like, in a way, that's kind of dark, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's not a cross. And then it's just like, I think about, you know, let's say going from being a slave or indentured yep. servant into getting yep. your own place. Imagine yep, like yep. the trauma of like, getting your place and you're probably worried about it being taken from you, right? Yeah. Because you never had nothing. So it's just like this worry, this trauma that, that people never, that never had nothing and then they get something. It's like literally these rituals to make sure you, your thing doesn't get taken from you or doesn't get destroyed, you know? Because you live in a perpetual... Yeah. This is like someone who wrote, who, who practiced this thing, practices mm -hmm. these things that, she, that are written here. It's like you live in a perpetual state of terror. You're scared of mm -hmm. something, of the world, mm -hmm. for good reason, you know? Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's, the first, yeah. that's what I started thinking about when I read that, read that, read those instructions. But, but I also like this idea of ritual. Yeah. I mean, because there's so many communities who have different rituals, folk tales. They can't necessarily pinpoint where it comes from. Um, but they're things that they know th that they have to do, you know, so it's like... Yeah, you ever saw the movie, sorry to cut you off, you ever saw the movie Daughters of the Dust? I've seen part of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's directed, uh, uh, it's, it's directed by Julie, Julie Dash, I believe, and it's... Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. she, her and Arthur Joffa used to be married, and he's the cinematographer yeah. on the film. But a big part of the film is... is the, the matriarchal, main matriarchal figure of the film 
she's holding on to these traditions. Things like that are written there, and her children are trying to get away from it, you know? And um, mm -hmm. she's like, these traditions, we brought these here over from Africa. We can't lose yeah. these. And they want to leave the, they're in like, it's called the Geechee Islands. Yes. And the mm -hmm. kids want to leave and go off into the, into the quote unquote real world, Western world. And the matriarch of the family, she's in, imploring with them to really think about it. And if they do go, take these, take these spirits, take these things with you, you know? And that's another thing I get from this is like, you know, um, us as a people keeping our culture, the, the remnants of things we brought with us from Africa or developed as slaves, you know, because we tend to want to yeah. shed those things and, uh -huh. um, and to, to assimilate. Yeah, assimilate. And, um, you know, instead of having some chicken bones, you want a Rolex. But I think that's what's also interesting about the, the, the actual home that she photographed, because it's like it's, it's made of stone. You know, so for me, foundationally, that's strong and sturdy. It's not a McMansion. Um, but I also like the cinematic approach to, to, the, to the full piece because it's like, you know, you almost have these three frames and then like the instructions are almost a script. You know, so there's something very performative about it as well. Even though the body is not present within it, um, you as the viewer activate the piece. 100%. And then also, it, in an airy way, it looks like a church. A yes. Bit, you know? Yes. And that's, so, so again, that's, going back to the idea of ritual. Yeah. It looks like a church. Spirituality. And, um, and there's something there, too, with the first picture and the last picture, with its uh -huh. the pictures repeated, but the yeah. that window door is open. You know, mm -hmm. she's, saying, she's saying something with that, you know? I mean, for me, that's the beauty of a, 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 a great piece, where it's like, their gestures are very simple, and if you spend time with them, it will continue to reveal things to you. Exactly. Um, you know, that window being open, you might see it, but don't always register, like, what does that mean? You know, because also thinking about this idea of hospitality, thinking about this idea of um, being welcoming, being loving, being forgiving, you know, despite what someone else might do towards you. Um, I think it's also kind of an interesting kind of way to look at this this piece as well. And also it being a brick um, house, that shows like the, some yes. type of accumulation of, of wealth. That it's not yeah. all wood, you know? You yeah, that, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You've had made it, made it a little bit to afford some bricks. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll move on to the next one. It's a Recruit, Terra Venezia, and Thomas Vu, um, Untitled. Uh, the days of this society is numbered, and I just love this piece. Yeah. Um, it's a newspaper, uh, silkscreen, um, text, and it's like very direct, but then it's still kind of subversive. Um, and what I love about Recruit and Thomas as collaborators, they use very simple materials, you know. Everybody has access to a newspaper, but what happens when you overlay it yeah. with this text, you know? And I think it was, it's so, super appropriate for now, where it's just like, you know, the tide is changing, right? And so what happens when the tide change, changes? Um, and how do we uh, embrace that change? Um, comfortable, uncomfortable, um, certain, not certain? And I was trying to read through the actual, the text, because the other thing that's really interesting is the juxtaposition of what's actually in the, in the background. So you have this ad for like, you know, Christie's with a- Louis Bourgeois. I believe that's Louis Bourgeois sculpture. Uh, but then if you look on the left panel, you see um, it says, uh, revealing a war on terror, you know, at first. Yeah. And so like similar to, the Hammett's piece, which we'll get to later, you know, also just kind of allowing the text within the found object to tell another story for me was super cool and interesting. When I look at this and when I feel it, I'm like, they're like, we don't have to do much. It's there in reality. Like, we don't have to make much to show you what's going on. It's the, mm -hmm. you know, the world's telling you, the newspaper's telling you what's going on, but we're going to put 
this is what's in the paper every day, but it just doesn't say it blunt, bluntly enough. So we're going to yeah. superimpose over the New York Times what the New York Times is kind of trying to say, but they can't say it, so we can say uh, it, the decline of Western yeah. civilization. You know, it's something yes. my friend Callie talks about in his work a lot, too, and we talk about a lot, is that's what, you know, we're living through and witnessing is the decline of Western civilization. Um, yeah. not, and doesn't mean apocalypse, doesn't mean everybody going to die. It just means yeah. this run that the powers that be have had is, is finite. You know, it may have happened by mistake or maybe they did it on purpose. The top is cut off. It's like days is like cut off, you know? Yeah, because I, I looked at it the first time I was like, the lays. I was like, oh, it's the days. Yeah, you know, I thought it said lays at first too. But I think, you know, that that's an artist's choice to kind of keep it that way because they could have made it perfect. Yeah, they could have rescreened it. Yep. They weren't interested in that. Um, and I think, you know, it is the job of artists a lot of times to kind of say those things that we want to say or may not know we need to say. The media is not necessarily going to tell you. Um, and so kind of this slippage of using media, newspaper, as a tool to kind of tell you, communicate what's going on. Let's move on to the next piece. Um, this is an artist who's actually, she's in LA, based in LA now. I'm um, Shanique Smith, monochrome, and she's a abstract sculptor, abstract painter. Um, this piece is made from vintage fabrics, um, artist clothing, and it's bound with ribbon on a wood panel. And so it was interesting because uh, I, I took a look at the piece because um, I, I don't think the picture does it justice in terms of seeing all these little bundles that she actually kind of organizes to create, you know, this painting. You know, so this slippage between like sculptural object and then traditional painting. But, you know, through, through, through the perspective of abstraction, which, you know, for me it was important to include this piece because I think there's, there's a lot of excitement right now within the mainstream, particularly around um, black artists, more so figurative work. Yeah. And there's not enough uh, um, of a acknowledgement of artists who are working within abstraction as their way to kind of communicate and express themselves. Yeah, I love that. This is one of my favorites that you've chosen for us to talk about. Oh, wow, okay. Um, I, love, <laughs> I love that she, she's done, like you said, you really need to see this in person because um, she's done it on a 2D format, which is a canvas, but then it's yeah. 3D because it's, you know, these bundles of her clothing. And even that alone is, yeah. I mean, that's abstraction right there, colliding 2D with 3D and she's done that through putting something 3D you could touch and feel that's bulging on what you're used to seeing paintings on. That alone is exactly. genius. You know, that alone is genius. And then the, you know, the gradation that she's got with just, you know, through clothing, choosing the clothing and get this gradation yeah. from dark to the, you know, then has a little area of the stripes. And then um, it's funny too, it's, it's another, I think well, another reason why it's my favorite that one of my favorites you chose is, I was just reading an article, which I'm pretty sure you might have read. Um, it was in the Times this week um, about mm -hmm. Rose, uh, Rosie Lee Tompkins, the artist who made all those quilts, black artist that made all those quilts. Yeah. So it made uh -huh. me think. Of, it made me think about her, and you know, I mm -hmm. wouldn't be surprised if she's you know inspired or you know definitely spent some time looking at. Rosie Lee stuff of feeling it because um, it makes me think of that and you know Rosie Lee is someone who I've seen her work but then reading this article is really uh -huh. I'm like obsessed that's literally that's up until we got into this call that's what I was you know doing upstairs in my room like um, just trying to find this book by Rosie Lee Tompkins but yeah this is amazing man it's just like uh, yeah no I mean I think it's dope because it definitely you know, weaves within that conversation around quilting, G's bed quilting, um, fiber, fiber artists, again, who also don't always get acknowledged. Um, I think about some of the work that like someone like a Faith Ringo, you know, iconic artist who, you know, is just now really kind of getting her due. 
Um, I mean, she's also obviously, you know, made some incredible paintings, but it's been really interesting to kind of see her like fabric, fiber works. And so I thought this was just a nice way to just also just change the pace in terms of like, you know, the different ways that artists use material to express themselves. Yeah, and also I, I feel that with, um, you know, women and, and artists of color, they can almost feel pressure to show that they can paint, you know? Uh -huh. Because that's like considered the highest level of art, like painting, right? And it's like, yeah. and then it's like, you put yourself in a place of, you know, maybe more criticism about your skill level or what you're doing when you get into abstraction or working with objects and stuff like that. Cause it's like, oh, you just took this and this and put it together, you know? Where painting really yeah. shows skill, where it's like, it's all on the same level, you know? It takes the same amount of skill to do the, um, I don't know, the Guernica, you know, Guernica by Picasso as to do this, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I feel like... Well, I, I, well not, to, not to cut you off, but yeah. one thing that I always tell, particularly young artists, is that, like, it's not just about skill, right? Like, when you're making a painting, like, I'm looking at the Joan Mitchell, which we'll talk about later, um, it's about the energy, it's about the vibration. Yeah. Like, you can be technically proficient, but say nothing. Yeah, it can have no soul. Exactly. You know, and I think it's the works that do have that soul and resonance, and when you look at it, you just immediately fall in love, and you might not always be able to articulate what it is about that piece, but, you know, the beauty of art is that you can spend time with it, and it will reveal itself. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why when I see her, I see someone who's not, She's definitely not caught up in that trap. And yeah, it's a good thing to urge young artists is don't get up in the, the dogma of showing skill, you know? Exactly. Yeah, it's telling stories. Yeah, um, exactly. So we'll move to the next lot, um, Gupta, Untitled. Uh, he's an artist based in India. This piece is stainless steel utensils and rope. Very simple materials. And there's actually a lot of detail within trying to make, bring these works together. So it actually fuses the works um, so they, they're bound together. So it's not like you okay. take a bunch of these objects and kind of just like arrange them. They're actually fused together to create this arrangement. And I was just doing some reading on him and he talks a lot about this idea of cultural heritage. Yeah. When I look at this and when I think about India, it makes me think about like you know, tea and kind of like tea rituals, tea ceremonies. But then also like, I think about, you know, colonial India, but then post-colonial India. Yes. Um, this almost feeling like um, a resistance in a way, you know, where you're kind of just accumulating all these objects and kind of like it's, you know, thinking about, you know, Nina, who we talked about before and Noah, like, this artist kind of just pushing back against um, the status quo of sorts. But I think what's also interesting is that these are everyday materials that are familiar. And I think yeah. the one thing that, you know, within my practice as a curator that's always been important is how do you create experiences that are accessible? And I think one way to do that is through the use of materials that are familiar to people, but then recontextualizing its expression. Yeah. Also, some, uh, what I feel when I see this, when I think about it, it's like, um, and you, you know, when you spring up colonialism, you know, one of the things that was taken and appropriated from India was tea by the, um, uh -huh. by the British. And, you know, you know, literally you could go to Claridge's for high tea, uh -huh. you know, go to okay. high tea and you get the little sandwiches and drink your tea and all that stuff. And, you know, in little porcelain, really expensive teacups where here he's taken teacups in the most proletariat way and made them into uh -huh. like this a pauper chandelier you know yeah a poor man yeah. chandelier and um yeah i you know if, if i ever if i ever met him i'd ask him was that the intention and obviously you know if that's yeah. the intention i get from it then that's what it is but it's like yeah. making a shan a chandelier which is this object that represents the the one percent and making mm -hmm. it out of the, you know the the ninety nine percent every day, like you said, an mm. everyday item, and make mm. you know it looks just as beautiful as a, a baccarat chandelier to me. You know, yeah, 
Maybe I didn't even, maybe I more didn't so. Even catch that, the chandelier. Huh? Read. I didn't even catch the chandelier read. No, yeah, that's what I first when I first saw it, and then when you when you said, and that's the great thing about having these talks, is okay. Yeah. I saw a chandelier, but then I wasn't thinking about colonialism, you know, until you said it. Yeah, yeah. And then it yeah, led me yeah. to that, you know. This is a really cool piece, and uh, I'm 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 excited to have had a chance to see it. Yeah, um, so likewise. we'll jump in. We got a couple more before we wrap up. Yeah. Um, Joe Mitchell. The piece is called No. It was made in 1961, 62. She was living in France at the time. You know, for me, Joe Mitchell is, you know, not only as an artist, a boss, but just also just as someone who really cared about creating opportunities for other artists through yeah. the establishment of the foundation. Um, you know, which is in New York and New Orleans, and the amount of artists who've been able to benefit uh, from the resources that the foundation has been able to create. Um, but also, you know, I think it was important to include this work, you know, building on what we were talking about with regard to Shanique in terms of like artists working within abstraction, but then specifically women who are working within abstraction. And when you look at this piece, um, you see uh, the virtuosity, the intensity. Um, some of the line work is very deliberate, and then you can see the improvisation, right? And so it, for me, it almost feels like jazz a bit. Yeah. Right? Um, and it just has this very kind of rhythmic um, feeling to it. You know, upon reading upon her, you, you realize um, she was able to through you know skill and tenacity and probably you know luck and all those things to able to break through in a male white male dominated male dominated um sector which was abstraction she's one of the only through to come exactly. women to come through at that time so uh no it's it's incredible i mean yeah even just i mean yeah it's even just the co you know the color story alone you know mm -hmm. you could just talk about that and then again yeah the free jazz like on that Coleman level of freedom, yeah. but but it's not like, yeah. and that's the thing about um, art like this. Um, there's a Basquiat quote. He said, he said people don't think I can paint. He's like I can paint what's considered really well. It's harder for me to do what I do, you know. Uh -huh. And I feel sometimes people don't realize like, again, whether it's making this, you know like that piece with the um, fabric and the clothing, or mm -hmm. this piece or other pieces, it's, in a way it's harder because it's like, there's less of a roadmap, you know? Exactly. Especially at the time when she was doing this. You know, because exactly. even if you look at who she's inspired by, she's inspired by Monet and Van Gogh, mm -hmm. but you don't see mm -hmm. that from, so for someone to be so inspired by these, these guys and then take it somewhere else, that's, you know, that's, exactly. that's genius level skill right there. Yeah, and, and it goes back to what we talked about um, a couple of days before about, you know, hiding your hand, right? And yeah. Particularly with painters, you know, and it's like really forcing the viewer to spend time in order to make those correlations, you know, whether it's color palette, whether it's how, you know, the paint is applied to the surface. Um, but, you know, whether you're a visual artist, musician, you know, filmmaker, for me personally, it's always been about like creating your own language and expression that is like you, you know, that is uniquely you. No one can copy it even if they tried to. Um, and that's, you know, something that I definitely enjoy about Joan's work. So next piece is by a younger artist, Christina Quarles. A piece is called Place. I've been aware of her work um, since she was at Yale doing her MFA. And um, her work deals with issues around uh, queerness, around identity, around the body. And um, I just love how she depicts the body. Yeah. It just feels, you know, to me, just kind of fresh and unique. Um, you know, these bodies are contorted, you know, but then they kind of meld together in a way, which is kind of interesting. And then I think in particular, her kind of navigating 
I don't know if they're personal questions or kind of public questions around her identity because, you know, she identifies as a black woman, but if you see her, she, you know, looks white. And mm. so I think that's something that she's always kind of toggling with within her work. And she's going to have a solo show at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago next year. And so, like, you know, at 35 years old, to be having a museum solo, you know, for me, that's kind of a, a, a clear indication that, you know, you're, you're working on an exceptionally high level. Um, and she doesn't produce a lot of works. Um, so, you know, she spends a lot of time crafting and creating every painting. And every time I see her work, I'm just like, damn. You can tell she's trying to push the conversation, you know, just like we were talking about with Joan into this new direction um, that we might not be particularly familiar with. No, man. I mean, again, I got to thank you because for, ch you know, these works you've chosen to pull out of this lot, this um, cell that's happening. And I'm um, just happy to learn and talk about so many female artists. And yeah, man, I mean, again, just like the work before it, um, you could just talk about the colors, oh. for, you know, before even getting into anything else, you know? Mm. And then, yeah, that's really powerful that, you know, how she's depicted herself, but like an alien. I can, I can only imagine, um, you know, I can't imagine but just from, you know, friends and things I've read and stuff I've seen and stuff I've seen in the world, just the experience of being queer in a heterosexual world, you know, um, heterosexual mm -hmm. dominated world, patriarchal male dominated world. Mm -hmm. you, you, there are times or maybe all the time you feel like an alien, you know? And yeah. your body is, especially as a woman, queer woman, what you're supposed to love or how you're supposed to um, show your body or feel about your body, what society says isn't probably never in sync with how a queer woman or qu queer ma man feels about their body and feels how they're seen, you know? Yeah. And I think that's um, something she's showing a lot with her and the, and the, the partner she's um, kissing, making love to in this painting. But I think that's, that's a, another thing that's important that you brought up is this idea of being seen, you know, regardless of like your background or tribe that you affiliate with. But I think also the intimacy um, that you see, because if I'm, if I'm looking at this correctly, it's hard to tell what, what, what the figure that's above, if the hands are holding the feet or something like that. Yeah. She, she's kind of, de she's deconstructed the body in a way where you really have to kind of like, you know, almost, you know, I think about, when I look at this, I think about, you know, probably Matisse. Yeah, um, but. Picasso. Yeah, even, um, yeah, 100%. But even the way she, um, they're embracing each other or the top figure is embracing the figure that's below it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. that, to me, that's just saying something about intimacy. Like, yeah. you know, that feeling of when you're in the bed with someone or kissing someone and like, and you really love them, really want them, you almost want to envelop them, you know? Be, in, yeah. you know, be, a, be inside of them in like the esoteric sense, and that's what I see there, you know? Like this figure yeah. just, you know, taking over the other figure. But even, but even looking at the title, Placed, you yeah. know, for me, it also sounds like this grounding, you know, kind of being grounded um, with a person, grounded in a space, grounded, you know, in terms of just like where you are mentally in life. Um, so this is, for me, it's, it's a really exceptional work. Yeah, you're right. Um, by, you, you're right because it's like place and then what's behind them. It's not a bedroom. It's the like, literally looks like the earth, the horizon, you know? Yeah. Like it's just them yeah. two. It's only them in the world. Exactly. And I think she's based in LA. Uh huh. And so for me, that's kind of a very west coast thing in terms of playing with the horizons yeah um, definitely because the sky just feels so big and so um vast and i know a lot of painters um that's what they love about la and they talk about the light yeah um, so when i was looking at the skyline because it's not really sunset um maybe sunrise with this kind of yellow line um but 
this idea of being in the landscape with your partner, I think is also kind of interesting too. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, so uh, the next piece I wanted to talk about was Charles White. Um, sometimes I feel like a motherless child uh, made in 1958 and it is ink and wash on board. Um, Charles White, another example of mastery. Um, and it was interesting because I looked, when I saw the title, it made me think about the Ghostface Ray record on Iron Maiden. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then as I did a, a, a more research, Odetta, the folk singer, did a version of the song. And then I came to realize that the song was actually, um, it was a Negro spiritual. And so it's kind of interesting to kind of like, you know, see titling as this device to kind of pull you into the piece. Um, and then the other thing about Charles's work, because um, he looked a lot at religious painting, European painting, but then was able to flip it um, and give it his own voice, right? And so like, I was reading like one of his favorite artists was El Greco, who for me was uh, an artist who was, that I enjoy. Um, and how do you like, elevate the figure, particularly in this case, a young black girl, um, to this kind of deity level. And you know, just very kind of simple. It's just like, it's, it's, it's ink, wash, and board. It's not like all these paints, it's not super complicated, and he's being able to create this vibration and this soul within this work, but just within his practice. Um, and it's, and you know, I'm excited He's finally getting the proper due. Unfortunately, it's posthumously, but um, this for me, you know, is one of the stars in the sale. Yeah, it's um, incredible. Yeah, one of the most powerful pieces in this lot. Yeah, it's great that you set, you set it off the conversation with the title because, again, title is dark because it's like, what does feeling like a motherless child really mean? It's not talking about your actual paternal mother, it's Mother mm -hmm. Africa, or, you know, mm -hmm. black people not having mm -hmm. a home. Mm -hmm. When you look at this picture, you see power. She's still prospering. And also mm -hmm. showing, you know, that era of um, being black in America, the lack of mm -hmm. childhood blacks had, because you had to grow up really quick, you know, mm -hmm. from just actually having to work. Like my, my dad's first job was when he was like seven. He's picking cotton. Oh, wow. Yeah, my dad's first job when he was like seven, eight years old, picking cotton. That's crazy. You know, um, then after that, he was laying bricks with my grandfather, you know? So my dad, okay. 65, he'd been working since he was single digits, you know? Even, wow. you know, that's something contemporary, um, even contemporary uh, blacks, we're not, go we didn't going through, you know? I didn't start working that young, mm. and I grew up in a working class family. Mm. Like my, you know, but, mm. so I see that like, lack of child, lack of innocence maybe, not innocence, but she looks like a grown little woman, you know? Mm -hmm. And then like the way the light is enveloping her. It's funny, it's something mm -hmm. about this painting gives me Starry Night too, that painting, the way the, yeah. those, you know? Definitely. Yeah, the way the marks, the marks, um, the way the marks move. Yeah. That's actually Starry Night, that's actually, I didn't even read, uh, yeah. Definitely, and he did. He did an Earth, Wind, and Fire cover. Yep, and I believe I he did uh, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac Hayes. Isaac Hayes. Okay. I think he did the cover for Black Moses. I could be wrong. Oh damn. I think so. Even this painting is almost like she's a superhero, you know? Because I imagine this thing she's holding is maybe she's taking, she's taking the clothes, and this goes back to working. She's taking, she's doing laundry maybe taking the clothes off the line. Yeah. It's like he took a photograph and he caught the wind blowing the, blowing the sheet as she's taking it off the line, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's caught her but in I his, think it, Yeah. It also, grace. for me, kind of illustrates the imagination of a young person. Yeah. And so, like, her imagining, you know, you said, you know, she looks like a superhero, so maybe she's imagining herself as, I don't know, Wonder Woman or something. You know, this is 58, so you don't have 
Pam Greer yet, but I'm sure there are other kind of iconic black women uh, who who were powerful. And you know, when you say that, and she, you know, she didn't have Pam Greer or the superhero, but it's like these people were superheroes in real time. Because um, I, um, shame on me forgetting the name of that child that um first woman, young black woman, she's a little girl, oh, yeah. that integrated, the first one to integrate schools in America, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think about her when I see that picture, that power, you know? To be yeah, like... And courage. Yeah, courage to be that young, be that young and, and to, to do that. But that courage wasn't just relegated to that young girl who integrated schools. If you were black in America, you lived in a constant state of anything could happen to you. So you, exactly. every black person had to have that courage, and to this day, still does. Exactly, exactly. So we got two more. Um, next piece is by uh, David Hammonds. Hidden drawing, Jordan begins eighth season as number one. Um, he literally takes a page from the Amsterdam News, which is a newspaper um, published in Harlem, mm. um, and envelops, and, you know, roll, basically rolls it. You know, so kind of thinking again about what Recruit and Thomas was doing with their use of newspaper and media, mm -hmm. and then Hammonds with this piece, which this piece was done in 91. One illustrating his love for basketball, but then the piece is wrapped in like a clothes hanger. And you know, depending on where people grew up, like when I was young, that was our hoop. You take the clothes hammer, jam it in the door, yeah. pull it out, you get a sock, you got a one-on-one -on -one game going. You know, so for me, it was kind of interesting thinking about like this idea of ingenuity, um, creativity. Um, you know, so the piece is newspaper, paint, rubber bands, tape, and a coat hanger. He has um, another piece, I believe it's called Higher Goals. Yes. That he did in 1983 in Harlem, I believe. Yes. And um, just kind of another example, you know, building on, you know, what Duchamp offered us through his practice, what Boyce offered us through his practice, using the familiar and transmuting that into the incredible, um, the supernatural, imbuing these objects with some type of, you know, juju for lack of a better word, um, and, and recontextualizing it. Um, and, you know, George is an icon. Hammond's you know, grew up, you know, played basketball in high school, but also, again, with the higher goals, is like pins mightier than a sword, with the sword being basketball, because, um, uh -huh. you know, the reason why he, he put, as you know, he put those hoops 60 foot high in Harlem is because you can't reach them, and that is that dream of being a basketball player is not reachable in a sense of, a, just on a mathematical scale, there's 300 spots in the NBA and millions of young black boys are trying to make it to that spot. And we're feeling yeah. we can either play music or play basketball or play sports. Where we, we know, without even having to dig, dig deep at all, the black pool of genius is, 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 is um, vast. And yeah. there's something there with it, this, like him taking the writing, a uh, newspaper article about Jordan and forming it into like, what looks like a pencil in a way and like you yeah. said, there's, you know, there's something there. Even in the little write-up, it's like, you know, basketball remains a favorite tar target, foil, and object of devotion. So it's like, he loves it, but then he hates it. Because it's almost like, yeah. it's like black people, we become like Christopher Reeves. He's yeah. an actor, trained actor, but he's typecast as Superman. And as black people, we exactly. become typecast as athletes or musicians, you know? I mean, that was the initial read when I saw the photograph, is that I thought, it was some type of pen or writing instrument. Uh, and then to physically see it, and you're just like, oh, it's like nowhere near that. Yeah. Um, but then it's just like I'm trying to reconcile the hanger. And then maybe it's this idea of suspension in space. Because the piece does feel like it's floating when you look at it. You know, basketball is a poor man's sport in the sense of you just need a basketball on the court. Whereas, you know, yeah. tennis, golf, hockey, part of the reason you don't see a lot of blacks in those sports is because they're expensive, you know? Exactly. All right, so we'll get to the last piece, which is to my left, Victor 25448 
by John Michelle Basquiat, made in 87. Seeing this work, and I think it's kind of just indicative of, you know, this COVID era. And like, you can do all the online shows you want, but it's different when you see it in real life. Yeah. Right? And, and to see it as a work on paper, for me also is kind of dope because it's like, we're so used to thinking about him for the most part working on canvas, even though there might be some assemblage that he's created. Um, the scale of the piece, you know, it has his you know, traditional use of language, but it's very poetic because when I look at it, you know, money order, that's something that I think about in the Bronx. It's like, you know, my mom's in Ghana and I gotta send her a Western Union, you know, every couple of weeks. Yeah. You know, so this, in thinking about his background as someone who's Haitian and Puerto Rican and this idea of remittances and the amount of money that circulates through remittances of people sending money back. On the right side of the piece, ideal, ideal. On the left side, it's like ideal, but then it's like deal. And so for me, that's probably a critique of something that he might be going through with relation to his art career. And then from what I read, he made this piece after Warhol passed. And so you see the bandage on the, on the figure. And this is one of the few times, at least I've personally seen the figure kind of like rendered, even though it's like a stick figure, um, that it's like very clear that this is a black brown body in suspension. And I think that's just so apropos for now, where I think a lot of people in general are just kind of in this place of uncertainty, suspension, don't know what tomorrow will hold. Um, and so I think, you know, this piece actually reveals more than what I initially thought. And it's, and it's just kind of this, you know, reaffirmation of the importance of physically seeing art. Yeah, because it's almost, you know, cool, he has ideal, which is a play on like, you know, commercial iconography and stuff. But then the big, yeah. the one with the most color, it's almost like it's yeah. earthquakes happening. Like his, exactly. you know, his ideal has been shaken. And then it's a good point you bring up Warhol died because obviously Andy dying was huge on him and some say led to him, you know, ODing, you know, relapsing and ODing on heroin. But also there, before Warhol died, something else traumatic happened. They had a group show. Okay. That sold no paintings. It was a flop. It got panned by critics. No one bought the work and it was the group show they did together. And it was a big deal for, um, Jean to have a group show with his idol and it flopped, yeah. you know? So that was something that sent him to funk and then Andy died. So it's like the band, I like liken it to earlier, earlier painting when he was in the early 80s where he drew about him getting hit by a car, you know? Mm -hmm. And when he had mm -hmm. his appendix taken out and he was in the hospital yeah. and his mom gave him Grey's Anatomy and then he, that's when he kind of start drawing like things with the human body and then another thing is, there's these symbols that hobos use that he was obsessed with. Like um, the one that says nothing to gain here. Hobos used to yeah. leave these symbols for other, home, um, other um, vagrants that were traveled by trains. So it's almost like, is he leaving? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's like, is he leaving that symbol there for other artists? There's nothing mm. to gain here in the art world, you know? Because this is where he was mm. at. His paintings were not, it's like, in his mind, his career was on a decline. His mentor died. Their last show flopped. You know, just nothing for him in his mind. You know, he was having a um, a crisis of conscience. And then even like there's that sketch above, in between the three ideals. It looks like a human brain, right? Look at the different symbols. There's the one symbol that says under it. It says that the symbol means a beating awaits you here. Nothing yeah. to gain. You know. Yeah. I'd be interested to do some research on Neptune, um, that, yeah. that, 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 um, that God, and see how, I'm pretty sure if we do some research on that, we'll figure out why he put that. It's also, I mean, I can't speak for where he was in New York at that time, but that's like indicative of a lot of communities in New York where like, you got the check cashing place before you got the bank. Oh yeah. You know, and you have a lot of people who are unbanked even to this day. Yeah, and usually, I mean, like, for me, that gives me a quick temperature of a space. If I see more check cashing places, then I see banks, and it's just like I already know what the potential demographic of that community is. Yeah, the socioeconomic makeup of what's going on, exactly. you know? 
Maybe that's where exactly. he, maybe he felt he, that's where he was headed back to. You know, I don't know. I mean, I think that's also the other thing is that you do have folks who live with that anxiety of going back to whatever that place is that they started that might not, and you know, it might be more humble beginnings, right? To have had this ascent, you know, whether it's money, fame, notoriety. And I think about a lot of people, you know, within their 20s who have these moments, some of them can navigate it and some of them can't. When you are first generation success, specifically when you become famous, um, fast and wealthy, that idea of having, losing, not even just losing the wealth, losing the notoriety and then you cast back into um, everyday life, maybe, maybe yeah. a wor to some might be a worse fate than death, you know? Yeah. You know, like yeah. there's this article I read about this NBA player who, through trials and tribulations, he got, you know, cut from the team. He blew the bit of money he made in his couple years in the NBA, and he was working at a McDonald's, and he quit because people kept noticing him working there. Wow. So he didn't even quit because he felt he was too good to work at McDonald's. He just, like, just people, you know, chastising him, like, hey, you're that NBA player and you work here. So that's definitely <laughs> something that haunts especially artists who come from um, working class or, you know, lower middle class uh, situations, just like, there is no bottom, you know? No, yeah, yeah. And even so. though he came from a, you know, people always try to say, oh, Basquiat, he, he didn't come, he came, he came from, a, his dad was a banker, but he didn't have a great relationship. He had a horrible relationship with his dad, you know? Yeah. Um, dad did not respect him going, like many, um, a lot of times with immigrant parents, you know, they want you to, take the safest route because they've worked so hard to make it as immigrants in America, which is, is the toughest exactly. thing. And then, you know, they see the, um, especially back then, going to become an artist is a fruitless pursuit, a dangerous pursuit, yeah. and they, you know. Yeah. And that was a big part of his um, contention with his father. There's a lot there and we didn't, you know, that we didn't see at first, right? But I think what's dope about his work, you know, similar to Nina is that there's a lot of layers that are within this work. I mean, same with Hammonds and Christina. And, you know, I think of a good painting like an onion. Yeah. It's going to continue to reveal itself as you, un as you peel the layers. Yeah. Um, and, like and, so, and like Nina, he draws you in with the color and the, yeah. the cues, of the pop cues, iconography but that you're, what, you're familiar with. Well, what's interesting is because it's on paper, you know, then it also creates this interesting void or um, with the white space. Um, and you're kind of really dealing with like the rawness of the gesture. As opposed to if it were on canvas, I don't know if it will read the same. Yeah, that always plays, that always plays a part in is the, you know, the materials used. And yeah. the, the artist, you know, so. they, they use the materials for a reason or, exactly. or lack thereof. Exactly. Sometimes even unbeknownst, so, to, and it has an effect on the work, sometimes even unbeknownst to them. Yeah, and I think that's where the importance of experimentation comes into play. And, you know, trying different materials, because there's even, I can't quite tell what it is, but it looks like some wax mm -hmm. on the paper. Uh, that brown kind of circle. Yeah. On the left lower corner. Yeah. Which for me was also just kind of interesting to see. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 for me, one of the highlights when you physically see the sale. A lot of great works in here. Um, 20th century contemporary art, evening and day sale, July 2nd. Um, and I just want to thank you, you know, for spending time chatting, going through these works, and just sharing what you see. And for me, it's always fun. Um, hearing the perspectives of others, you know, and, and what they see or, or, or what I might not see. And um, for me, that's, that's the beauty of art and that's how we learn, that's how we grow. Um, and I think being able to kind of weave in a lot of the different issues that are happening right now, um, I think was important to both of us and not to just kind of just talk about artwork, but talk about like, you know, where do some of these practices you know, hopefully inspire people, 
but then I also think can function as a timestamp, you know, for what was happening in that period, but also what's what's happening right now. Yep, and you know, yeah, it's been great talking with you, and you know, learn. I definitely learned some things I wouldn't have learned just looking at or talking about this stuff on my own, from you know, going back and forth with you. But yeah, I agree with you. Is like the main thing about this, and you know, there's the whole thing of you know the pieces, the worth, the rarity, but. I mean, the main, the main job of an artist is to talk about the human condition, right? So it's exactly. great to talk about some, these artists who are talking ab about the human condition that, as it applies to, you know, the current events that were go you know, going on in the world, you know, this new civil rights movement, uh, systematic racism, COVID, all these things, you know, um, ongoing fight of, of, for queer, you know, queers are fighting for their rights, um, women. So it's been great to talk through all these vignettes of the human condition, referring to people of color and women and the LGBT community, you know, on, you know within the scale of this auction, you know? It's yeah. Beautiful, it's beautiful. Yeah, so thank you for your time. I appreciate it. All right, Larry, thank you. And thank you to Phillips. All right, thank you. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you, Phillips.